December 2nd, 2001, the day Enron declared bankruptcy, bringing the energy company's epic scandal out of the dark and into the light. It ruined lives, led to two dozen convictions, and resulted in sweeping government reforms, a corporate collapse that rocked Houston. Robert Arnold covered the fall of Enron. Joel Eisenbaum covered the trials that followed. And now tonight, 20 years later, both have special reports live from the old Enron building in downtown Houston. Robert, Joel. Chris, I would say over the years, Robert and I have definitely covered our fair share of Enron stories. And what we try to never forget are the people involved. And speaking of which, you just talked to one of the key players, Robert. Sharon Watkins, she was a vice president with Enron who tried to warn CEO Ken Lay the company's financials were being manipulated. She says at first her concerns were dismissed, then federal investigators found her work. My biggest disappointment was that um, I was really, you know, not believed. In 2001, Sharon Watkins says she felt like the Greek parable of Cassandra, cursed with knowing the future, but no one believing her predictions. No one believed me in the fall of 2001. They just acted as if this was a minor hiccup in the road and could be handled with some good PR. Watkins remembers the meeting she had with Enron founder Ken Lay. Watkins had discovered Enron's accounting manipulations were hiding massive debt while overinflating how much money the company was actually making. I did come armed with a lot of memos and evidence, Excel spreadsheets, PowerPoints. Watkins remembers thinking Lay was taking her seriously. Then he asked her whether she thought Chief Financial Officer Andy Fastow was doing a good job. I was just dumbfounded. You know, I've just sat here and told you how the Chief Accounting Officer and Chief Financial Officer have cooked the books. You can't then conclude they're doing a good job. Watkins, believing at the time Lay was unaware of the unethical practices, would save the company he founded by cracking down on bad apples and making an honest admission to investors. I shouldn't have gone by myself. Um, I, I should have gotten more people to go with me because Ken Lay dismissed me as one lone voice, one lone opinion. And just as Watkins was feeling the sting of being a whistleblower, Enron collapsed. Federal investigators and Congress then found all of the work she had presented to Ken Lay. Watkins became one of the main witnesses in an investigation that led to dozens of convictions and massive changes in how corporations are allowed to do business. I can't believe it. Feels like yesterday, but two decades is a long time. In 2002, Watkins was named one of Time Magazine's Person of the Year, and she co-authored Power Failure, the inside story of the collapse of Enron. But there was also a cost. She lost friendships, and the trajectory of her career was forever altered. But they view me as the person that, that blew everything up when I'm not the one that cooked the books or allowed the books to be cooked. Watkins still considers herself lucky. She teaches business ethics at Texas State University and corporate leadership at North Carolina University. Enron comes up quite often. And over the past two decades, she's traveled the world speaking out on corporate malfeasance. But the reality is frauds start small. So to stop them at their very inception is wonderful. One of the images I will never forget from 20 years ago is all the people who came pouring out of these buildings after finding out they had lost their jobs and in many cases, their life savings. I mean, it was absolutely catastrophic for tens of thousands of Enron employees, and not just them, it sent their entire families into tailspins. But now 20 years later, a lot of people have turned it around. To do this to the employees who were so loyal and dedicated, and this is what we get back for repayment. 20 years after what was at the time the largest corporate bankruptcy in U.S. history, Enron's cautionary tale of collapse is now well-worn. At some point, uh, the head of this company knew that it was cratering. But before the world crumbled for 20,000 Houstonians and their families, oh, were there good times. To be a part of the Enron juggernaut was a badge of honor, especially as a kid straight out of rice. You tend to pick out the positive, and that's what I choose to do, right? I choose to look at my Enron experience as very positive in terms of the personal and professional experiences that I have. Dung Tran, who wore a lot of hats with Enron over seven years, landed on his feet. He now owns a retail energy service provider based in Houston, but not everybody fared as well. When I saw the stock drop, I called to sell, 
and was told that I was locked out. When you look at the top dogs, and I covered the trial, do you look at those guys now and say they were criminals? You know, most people I've spoken to that worked at Enron would say this, which is there's prescriptively what actually occurred, but then there's also the firsthand experiences we might have had with each one of those executives. Ken Lay, Enron's founder, was convicted of multiple fraud charges but then died in July 2006 before sentencing. Jeff Skilling, the former CEO, served the most time, more than a decade in prison and then a halfway house before being released in 2020. And Andy Fastow, Enron's former CFO, got out of prison in 2011. Corporate finance laws in our country changed because of Enron. Enron's bankruptcy was a watershed moment in U.S. corporate history. And all of it happened right here. I can only look at things from the standpoint of my personal situation as well as the situation of those that I stay in touch with. And so for us, we've chosen to remember the good times. If you were working for Enron when it collapsed, that was no doubt a pivotal moment in your life. And so every year, including tonight, a lot of former Enron employees get together. They find it therapeutic. Yeah, I know a lot, for a lot of people, even though it's been 20 years, the pain's never really gone away. Chris, Christine? All right, Robert Joel, thank you.